Hello and welcome to this new episode of Chocolate Pro TV series, where we discover what is shaking the world of chocolate in Asia and Oceania. I'm Cherry Kin from Bueller, and with me today, we have invited Director of Insight and Global Analyst for Confectionery and Snacks at Mintel Food and Drink, Marcia Mongolonski. Hi, Marcia. Hi. So to start, um, yes. would you like to introduce yourself and maybe a little bit about Mintel? I'd be glad to. I'm Marcia Mogolonsky. I'm the Director of Insight for Mintel Food and Drink. I also have been covering the confectionery industry for Mintel for 20 years. And before Mintel, I was covering the chocolate industry as a consultant working for a number of clients. Mintel is a global market research firm with offices just about everywhere you can think of. I think our next one will open on the moon. I'm maybe Mars. And we follow trends and innovation and consumer response to every category you can think of, including confectionery. Okay, great. So today we are going to be talking about the current business situation and opportunities for chocolate, how consumers demand have shifted in recent years, and wrapping it all up with a look into your crystal ball as to what the future of chocolate <laughs> looks like. So right. to kick off this interview, I'd like to ask the question that has been on everyone's mind. You know, since the global pandemic started last year, there seems to have been a mix in opinions of how the pandemic has impacted the chocolate industry, with some saying that it has largely been negative, while others claiming the opposite. So Marcia, in your opinion, how has the ongoing pandemic affected the chocolate market in general? Well, some people say it's been negative, some people say it's been positive, and the answer is that everybody's right because it depends what kind of chocolate you're talking about. It depends which market you're in. So we've seen varying results. In the United States, for example, which is the world's biggest chocolate market currently, um, volume sales, which is how much we're consuming, have dropped 1% from um, 2019 to 2020. That sounds sort of about right. People love chocolate. People reach for chocolate in times of all sorts of insecurities from uh, breaking up with your boyfriend to mm -hmm. uh, some horrible thing that happens in the world. You always reach for chocolate. For those who love chocolate, it's a security blanket. But with so many people cooped up in their homes, access to chocolate has declined because although you can, you can get it on Instacart or uh, whatever online system you use, it's not the same as going to the store and making that spontaneous purchase. And yep. so for those reasons, chocolate sales or volume sales have declined. I don't have a dollar sales figure because every country is different and trying to compare dollar sales to, to all the different currencies is just misleading. Using in dollars is just misleading. So I'm sticking to volume sales. Russia is the second biggest market and their chocolate consumption, chocolate sales went up. Volume sales were up 4%. So you see it varies from market mm -hmm. to market. I see. So um, which segments of the market do you think is creating the most opportunities for chocolate and confectionery companies? Segments of the market? Well, um, not gifting. Gifting is not, this is way down because we're not doing that anymore. Um, the yeah. regular tablets and those kinds of uh, small packages that you can order and large, mm -hmm. large volume packages, snack bags, um, uh, pick and mix, those sort of things where you get a bag of chocolate to eat all by yourself. It's been a varied rhythm to everything. It depends where each person is in their personal pandemic journey. It depends where each market is in its personal pandemic journey. We can say pretty much that the kind of chocolate you would go to a fancy boutique for, they have suffered seriously. While the kind of chocolate you can order online um, from your favorite source, those have relatively done well. Uh, okay. I think that is an interesting perspective. And also, you know, as consumers, we see that um, increasingly on social media, uh, or we have this health, healthier choice labeling and health scanning apps. These are all accelerating the transition towards more health conscious snacking choices. So how can chocolate manufacturers uh, chocolate manufacturers, sorry, adapt for healthier chocolate and even like better for you chocolate? Ah, that's a great question. I actually just published, um, Mintel just published my uh, 
future of the look ahead for the next two years, the next five years and beyond in the confectionery industry. And I did approach the healthier chocolate problem because it's a huge problem. If you can imagine everybody in the world is saying, we've got to eat better, we've got to eat healthier, we've got to cut down on sugar. And every time we do a survey and we do a survey across 35 markets, people list sugar reduction as one of their most important things that they're looking for. Then you turn to chocolate. And we have an expression in the United States, whenever someone proposes something we don't like really much, we say, oh, that sounds really good, but not in my backyard. Don't put that wind tower in my backyard. Don't do anything in my backyard. Someone else can take care of it. Well, for sugar, for chocolate confectionery, I see it as a not in my backyard proposition because you say to people, what are you looking for in chocolate? Low, lower sugar. Have you tried lower sugar chocolate? No. What do you think lower sugar chocolate tastes like? Doesn't taste good. So there we have the big problem. You eat chocolate because it tastes good. When we, Every survey we do, why do you buy chocolate? For taste. No one buys chocolate they don't like the taste of. If the sugar-reduced chocolate doesn't taste good, people are rejecting it, and they already have it in their minds that this stuff doesn't taste good. Mm -hmm. We actually drilled down in one of our surveys and looked at the people who said they had actually tried sugar-reduced chocolate. We asked them, okay, you finally we found some people who tried it. What do you think of the taste? A third of the people said it tastes the same as regular chocolate. Yay. A third of the people said, mm, I don't know, not sure. And a third of the people said, can't stand it. Doesn't taste the same. So there's still a ways to go before sugar-reduced chocolate comes into being. What about the other benefits of better for you? Do we want to see protein enhanced chocolate or fiber enhanced chocolate or um, vitamin enhanced chocolate? Well, that's also a difficult route to choose because do you want your chocolate to be a treat or do you want your chocolate to be a medicine? Are you going to turn to chocolate when you're desperate and say, I'm so sad, I'm going to have some chocolate, but it's got protein in it. I don't need protein. I want chocolate. Or are you going to turn to chocolate and say, this is my bodybuilding chocolate. I'm going to eat this chocolate to be healthy. It's got a very difficult road to follow. The main thing chocolate does for better for you is better for you mental wellness. Chocolate is without question a mental hygiene support medicine. It makes you mm -hmm. feel good. And while mental health is didn't used to be such a big issue. People just say, tough it out. We don't, we can't tough it out. This has been too tough for all of us. Mental health has come to the forefront as a very important factor in our lives. So chocolate already has a great better for you positioning as better for your mental health. How it's going to fare as be better for your physical health and using it as medicine or using it with some medicine in quotation mark, vitamins, minerals, fiber, whatever, that's still a kind of fuzzy avenue, and I'm not sure exactly what manufacturers are going to do to persuade people to follow a dosage package and say, I should have two pieces of chocolate and get my vitamins. I'm not sure how that's going to play out. I see. Yeah, it seems like, um, as you mentioned, there seems to be a really fine line that manufacturers have to uh, manufacturers have to thread along in terms of whether they want their chocolate to taste good with the high sugar content or provide that uh, physical physical health benefit. Well, I think right. I should add, I should add that what's happening is we're not all eating every piece of chocolate that comes our way. I mean, some of us might, but for the most part, people are taking care of their physical health by measuring the amount of chocolate they mm -hmm. eat. We did ask a question, how do you control your sugar intake with chocolate? You know, when you're eating chocolate and um, about 20, 25% uh, of respondents, this was in the US, 25 respondents percent of respondents said, I just eat less. I'll just cut back on how much I eat. So portion control is a big deal. 25% said, um, I'll stop eating chocolate, which is a scary number for us, that people would actually stop eating chocolate. And only 13% said, um, I'll go to the low sugar one. So again, low sugar chocolate was butts heads with people who would rather give up the chocolate altogether or give up and portion control their chocolate versus switching to lower sugar. I think you also mentioned earlier, um, you know, with the whole wanting to add more protein to the chocolate, 
I think this also reminds me nicely of um, this upcoming trend of um, plant-based food, vegan food. So um, on this trend, we also recently already seen major confectionery players announcing their vegan chocolate new products or variants. So how do you see this trend developing in the future? And do you think that it will catch up in Asia? Okay, let's have a chocolate lecture for a minute. Um, <laughs> I feel like the chocolate teacher. I did teach college for a few years, and I guess I'm going to be a chocolate teacher. Not all chocolate has um, dairy products in it. Uh, the vegan chocolate is looking to remove, pr primarily looking to remove dairy milk and other mm -hmm. animal products in chocolate, right? Well, if you like dark chocolate, you're not getting any animal products in your chocolate. You're only, and you're not getting dairy. You're only getting chocolate. If, however, you love milk chocolate, that's where the problem lies, and that's where the vegan <clears throat> chocolate is moving in. It's replacing the dairy milk in milk chocolate with non-dairy milk, so uh, almond milk, oat milk, whatever. It has become very popular in Europe and in the United States, not as much in the United States, more in Europe than in the United States, excuse me, <clears throat> to look for chocolate that has no dairy and calling it milk, M-Y-L-K, whatever, yep. almond milk, chocolate. I think it's a great idea for those who don't want to eat dairy or can't eat dairy. I think it will become popular in more markets where people are avoiding dairy. In Asia, I can see it becoming popular, especially in markets where um, people are dairy averse or trying to mm -hmm. restrict dairy, especially if it delivers on taste and there is the thing this stuff if it's imitating a dairy bar if, if it's a brand let's say brand x which we always liked brand x dairy milk we've been eating brand mix dairy milk our whole lives it's delicious and here comes brand x dairy non-milk milk chocolate and it doesn't taste like the original dairy milk milk chocolate no one's going to want to eat it unless they have a very serious reason for avoidance so again, it, it hangs on taste. I think the more successful path might be to start from scratch and say, just taste this fabulous new bar. There's nothing like it on the market because it's dairy free and it tastes like it's got the mouthfeel and the creaminess and all that stuff you would normally expect, but you have no benchmark to compare it to. You can't say, well, it doesn't taste as good as the one before, I don't wanna buy it. So that's the way this is gonna be more successful. Come in with a brand new brand and don't say, my favorite brand is now dairy free and it tastes icky. Say this is a yeah. whole new brand. It's delicious. It's dairy free. That's probably the way it's going to be more successful. Of course, that also brings up the question of price. And this was a big hang up for the first brand name dairy bars in Europe. They promised to be everything that their original was except dairy, but they were much more expensive and people didn't like them because they didn't deliver on taste. So I think the best way that we will see more vegan chocolate spreading everywhere is to find new brands, brand new mm -hmm. brands that aren't benchmarked against an expected taste, mouthfeel and taste memory. Yeah, it's a good point. Reminds me of um, Coke when it first came out also with the Coke Zero, Diet yes. Coke. Yes. It's like the same kind of thing. Everyone's comparing. Yeah. Everyone has very strong taste memory. I mean, taste memory is one of the things that we we kind of just assume and we forget about that people who grew up eating a certain thing or drinking a certain thing have grown up with that flavor. And the minute someone tinkers with it, they don't like it. So that's yeah. what I see going on. Mm. Well, when we talk about chocolate, cocoa, the main ingredient is, of course, also a huge topic to explore. So Asia is also producing cocoa, although it's not as famous as the African uh, supply yet. But do you see a market for Asia's specialty chocolate in the future? Yes, I'm excited about it. I mean, let's be honest. Indonesia is already a known chocolate provider. Indonesia provides is the, sec is the third biggest provider after um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. The third one is Indonesia. So Asian chocolate from the Indonesian perspective is already a known quantity. All the different little growers of chocolate, we remember, okay, professor's talking again, 
20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator is a whole bunch of places to grow chocolate. Look at the success of the South American chocolate market and the Caribbean chocolate market. Those specialty chocolates are doing great and people love them. People love these specialty chocolates. It's almost like discovering a new wine. Oh, I've discovered this fantastic chocolate from Grenada or from um, St. Lucia or something. These are, these are very uh, big deals to the Epicurean chocolate eater. And I would imagine that Asian chocolate, I've, I've seen chocolate from Vanuatu and all sorts of places. I have to go to a map to figure out where they are. And these come onto the market and people get very excited. So I'm very hopeful for the Asian chocolate market. Um, on this topic, how, would you, how do you see the future of chocolate evolving, say in like a 10-year horizon? Mm. There is one big problem with the cocoa industry that has to be resolved. Most of the chocolate that is, or most of the cocoa, cocoa that is sold in the world comes from Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And there is a terrible problem with child slave labor in those markets. We don't talk a lot about it. Um, it comes up in the news, usually around holidays. People will suddenly wake up to the fact that a lot of child slave labor or child labor is being exploited in these markets and people get concerned and then they'll do nothing. There've been a lot of efforts to do something about it. I think we have to face up to the fact within the next 10 years, the amount of knowledge we have about what's going on in the market has to be addressed and we have to find better ways of assuring the safety and um, health of those who are, work in the field. That's gonna be mm -hmm. a big deal. Will it stop cocoa from being produced in these markets? No, but I think that people will become more cognizant of the fact that these are things that have to be addressed. We do have an advantage in the world of talking about chocolate, which is that so many people love chocolate and chocolate appears in so many foods. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about cocoa, which is in cookies and it's in biscuits and it's in cereal and it's in breads and it's even in some savory um, preparations. It is a popular food group, food type. And I think the future is, is great for it as long as we can get a handle on the um, labor issues, which are going to mm -hmm. uh, jar or, or disrupt supply chains because people are getting concerned. So it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Otherwise, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I think everything is so transparent and available on the internet. I think it will be definitely worthwhile, even from the company's perspective, to look into this. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about in terms of um, examples of future products? you know, like um, innovations that are noteworthy? Okay, well, one thing that's interesting that's happening is um, the use of cocoa fruit to replace sugar. And this is very new. One major manufacturer has started using it and has introduced cocoa fruit chocolate in the Netherlands and in France, and they hope to move into other markets. So I said, nobody wants to eat a low sugar chocolate, but what they've found is a chocolate sugar to replace sugar, sugar, if you see what I mean. That's also a great example of upcycling um, part of the cocoa pod that was discarded before. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Flavor-wise, oh, we have a bazillion discussions about flavor all the time. Without fail, if you go to look at our Global New Products database, base, um, Intel has a wonderful Global New Products database, and you pull up all the chocolate innovation for the last two years, and you rank the new launches by flavor, it's always unflavored because chocolate in itself is the most popular flavor, always followed by hazelnut. And then it gets more interesting. So hazelnut, chocolate, um, we see more spicy, savory and floral notes coming into chocolate because what we see happening, and this is a general thing that I think is interesting that cuts across a lot of categories is we're trying to retrain our palates to accept less sweet flavors. This is another going back to nobody wants to eat sugar, reduced chocolate. Instead, we're setting ourselves up to look for chocolate that's a bit savory, a bit spicy, um, that doesn't use as much sugar because it doesn't have to. It's not that they are yeah. reducing the sugar to reduce the sugar. They're changing our taste thresholds to improve our acceptance of different flavored chocolates. So this is what we're going to keep an eye on also is how we are reframing the way we think of taste and chocolate. Mm. And how about in terms of texture? Do you see any trends in that area? 
Textures, they come and go. People's preferences come and go. I've seen everything in my years of following the market. I mean, we went through a phase where people were putting popping candy to add extra texture to chocolate. People are putting in cocoa nibs because they offer a different texture. Um, sticky textures, crunchy textures, everybody loves to experiment. Uh, and if you do, again, a global new products database search, you'll see a wide range of textures. I don't see anything specifically um, coming to the fore is saying that all chocolate has to have X in it to be successful. I think what we have to look for is chocolate that is interesting, that is different. Mm -hmm. And in this age where everybody shares much more than I want to share on social media, something that's share worthy is always good. If you come up with a chocolate that has, I don't know, something inside there's cricket chocolate now that has a different mm. texture and a bug um that insta appears on instagram all the time look what i found i found delicious chocolate with crickets in it or worms or whatever else um textures will continue to change we will see mm. everybody's looking for the next most exciting instagrammable social network worthy texture and that's going to change all the time and then, of course, just to make it complicated, those people who only like smooth chocolate, but we won't talk about them. So, <laughs> so um, regarding all these innovations and the future of this chocolate evolving, who do you think will be better able, better positioned to seize these opportunities? Like you have startups or chocolate leading companies. Before the pandemic, I would have said to watch the small startups um, because they are much more nimble. They don't have to change entire product lines to do this. They're just creating it in their back uh, factory. You know, they're making it up. Um, but that's changed since the pandemic. A number of small startups aren't starting up as much as they used to because they don't have the foot traffic. They don't have the ability to get samples to people. They don't have the ability to share things except if they can manage to do it online and to get heard online in this vast sea of online noise out there is very challenging. And that means that at this point in time, it may be the larger manufacturers who stand more of a chance of effecting change. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're a year into the pandemic and in different markets, that means different things. I know in Europe that um, chocolate boutiques aren't really open yet. Um, I know in the UK and in the United States, two major chocolate boutiques have shut down. I mean, in the UK, Godiva I mean, in the U.S., Godiva has closed all its stores. And the Godiva store is where you would go to try something new because they would let you sample and you would taste and smell and touch. That doesn't exist anymore. They're moving to online yeah. and to retailers. In the U.K., Thornton's, owned by Ferrero, um, has shut down all its retail stores. Again, removing the chance to sample and taste and smell and touch. This is going to be very hard for smaller upstarts to come to terms with. Unless mm -hmm. they can somehow figure a way to make it as enticing online as it is, is in person. And this leaves the way for trusted big brands to say, oh, you know, you trust us to give you all the best chocolate. Try this interesting new one. So it's something to watch. It depends how the pandemic plays out and how soon people return to in-store shopping and how soon mm -hmm. they return to the urge to face up to touching things they normally would not touch during the pandemic, like a shared sample tray and things like that. Mm. Yes, I think this also ties back to your point earlier on, you know, whether they are able to create something that really excites the customer mm -hmm. and make them um, willing to try out their new products. Yeah. So I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much. I think you already, you know, provided us with so much insights and that um, I'm sure our audience will find this very insightful and get a lot from this. Thank you for your time, Marcia. Thank you. And if anyone needs more information about Mintel or about Mintel's chocolate research, they can contact Mintel and we will help you get in touch with what you need. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you.